All right, so now it's time to talk about triple integrals. And theoretically, this is not too different than what we did before. We are now going with our domain is something in R3, and it's moving into R. So in three dimensions here, Y, Z, we would have some sort of region, maybe this little oddly shaped bowl thing, and so you'd say this is B. I'm not sure why I'm using B, I just am. B is this three-dimensional object. Now, you would do the same thing that we did before. We would divide it up into a bunch of little boxes. and so on. We partition the whole thing so that everything is in at least one box. And then we would do a triple sum where we would sample from each of these boxes. We would take a point in each box we would sample whatever it is, maybe it's temperature, maybe it's charge, and then, or it could be density if we were just trying to get mass, times the volume of each box. Then we would take the limit as the size of the boxes goes to zero. And that will give our estimate, well, without the limit, it's an estimate of volume, or sorry, of mass, or whatever the function is, but with the limit, it turns into a triple integral. F of x, y, z, d, v. Now, in most of the time, we are not going to be doing this using the sums, but I feel it's important to point it out because in real life, you very rarely find a function that's easy to integrate. So you're usually having to do estimates either by dividing up into boxes and taking a sample from each point, or by finding another function that's almost the same as what you're interested in and is easier to deal with. Now, if we say B is a box, let's say B itself wasn't this weirdly shaped thing. Let's say B were just a box. And so X goes from A to B, Y goes from C to D, and Z goes from E to F. So if A, B, cross C, D, cross E, F. So then that integral here could be written as integral, 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 F of X, Y, Z, dx, dy, dz, where x goes from a to b, y goes from c to d, z goes from e to f. And Fubini's theorem says if f is continuous, order doesn't matter. We can do the y first or the z first. Okay, Fubini's theorem actually says a lot more specifically about when you can change the order. It says even if it's not continuous, there are times when you can change the order. But for our purposes, just knowing if it's continuous, we can rearrange the order however we wish. So let's start with a simple box integral. So we will do a triple integral of x, y, z squared dv across b, where b is the set of all x, y, and z such that uh, x is between 0 and 1, y is between negative 1 and 2, and z is between 0 and 3. 
you don't have to draw this because it's a pretty straightforward one. They've sort of given you the answer already. But if you did, it would look like what x would go from 0 to 1, y would go from negative 1 to 2, and z would go from 0 to 3. So it would be like uh, maybe like this. Something like that. Not the best drawing in the world, but mm, something like that. Maybe put another... Yeah, that looks more like it. Okay, so... I'm going to factor this one, because we've said before that if the function can be factored into an x and y part, then we can just split it up. And the same is true if we got... That should say dy silly we need the x part the y part and the z part because the x integral will ignore the y and the z so we can just pull them out and the same for all the others so x goes from 0 to 1 y goes from negative 1 to 2 and z goes from 0 to 3 this equals 0 to 1 of x squared over 2 times negative 1 to 2 of y squared over 2 times 0 to 3 of z cubed over 3, which is 1 half times 4 over 2 minus 1 over 2 times 27 over 3, which is 1 half times 3 halves times 9 over 1, which is 27 over 4. So, that's the basic kind. Let's clear this page and do a few more. Alright, now, most of the time, you have uh, not just a box, you have some other shape. So let's say our region is something like this. Hmm. So we've got a ceiling here. We'll call it u2 of xy, and a floor we'll call u1 of xy. Now the shadow of it is d. So we'd basically project down, or we'd have a d, and we'd project up, I guess, more likely, to the top and the bottom. And so at every point in d, we're going to subtract in order to get... The, basically the distance between the ceiling and the floor at every point. And so the if this is f, we're evaluating some function f, and this whole thing, this 3D region is e. d is the shadow of it. So the integral, we're doing triple integral of f dv across e, well that would be the same as doing the double integral across d of parentheses you know of f dz from u1 of xy to u2 of xy and then integrate that dA. So this is just another version of the iterated integral. We are first saying the ceiling is u2 xy, the floor is u1 xy, so we're integrating f, whatever it may be, across that whole top to bottom. We are then going to say, well, that's the same as saying, once we project it, we get d, which will be a region in just x and y, but it'll be weighted based on f. So what we'll have is u1 of xy 
to u2 of x, y, dz. And then maybe we will go g1 of x, g2 of x, where the top half here would be g2 and the bottom would be g1. And so at every point, we'd have a top and a bottom that we'd subtract. And then we would find, so that would be dy, and then we would finally go x from a to b. Uh, that's x, not x. Let me uh, make that look more like an x. Okay, now, the order is not the key. In fact, there are five other orders possible. The point here really is that each integral eliminates one variable. So if you'll look at this here, this first integral, we start with a function f. I guess I never wrote the f in there. It should be there. But we start with a function f, and we integrate z from a function of x and y to another function of x and y, meaning once that's done, there won't be any z's. We then go to the next one, y. It goes from a function of just x to another function of just x, so there won't be any y's. And then the final variable, x, we need to get rid of it, so we replace it with constants a and b. So this is the point, the key point to this that I think is most important in understanding is that each time you do an integral, you are smashing it down to eliminate one variable. So for the way it's written here, we would mean we'd have a big press up above that would smash this whole thing down onto just the x, y plane. That's supposed to be a y. All right, <clears throat> so that's the idea here then. Each time you do a variable, an integral, you think I'm getting rid of one variable, I am crushing it down onto one of the planes so it's no longer there. And it can be helpful, if you're having trouble with the drawing, to sort of mentally skip the first integral and just think, what will it look like once I've smashed it down? So let's do some examples. Yeah, You'll never hear me say that this 3D drawing stuff is easy. I find it very difficult, and I'm sure most of you do too, but I'm going to try to just give you, from my experience, tricks that make it a little easier. All right, so let's say we say this. Evaluate triple integral across E of Z dV, where E is the solid in the first octant that means where x, y, and z are all positive, bounded by the surface z equals 12xy and the planes y equals x, x equals 1. These examples are straight out the book, and they are also, there's space for them in the notes online. Okay, so let's see how we're going to do this. All right, I'm erasing this now because you can copy this down. It's one advantage of online class that I know you can pause, so I don't have to worry if I've given enough time you to get everything. Okay, so we want to graph z equals 12xy because we know that z is supposed to be between those. 
So it can be helpful to have a visual there. All right, so we'll draw like this, x, y, z. And again, this is only because I already kind of know the answer. You would probably have to do a little trial and error to work this out. But our planes were y equals x and x equals 1. So that means y equals x would be like this. It would go down between y and x, uh, diagonal line exactly between them, which then would go up like this, and we'd have a vertical plane. So it would be like, you know, everything above this line. And then we have x equals 1, so that would be like this. Here's the x equals 1 line. Okay, so this is our point that's really interesting. We can erase this other piece because it's not really relevant to us. Oh, shoot. Undo. All right. And so we've got these two. We make this little triangle. That's our D. It's the region in the XY plane. And then we need to say, what is z equals 12xy? Well, I think about it. What it's saying is that if x and y are both 0, then z would also equal 0. So it starts here at the origin. And as we go away, as x and y both increase, this thing will increase pretty fast. In fact, if we go along the x equals y line, it will be the same as 12x squared. So we'll get kind of a parabola. So let's draw just sort of a parabola going up this way. And then we'll connect the dots because it's a 3D shape, so we should be able to draw a line between them. And so this gives this sort of oddly shaped figure where we've got this triangle and above it is this curved surface defining our roof. Now, I said a minute ago it can be helpful to just skip the first integral. So let's just say we want to do z first. All right, so we know that z is going to go from 0 to 12xy. So what I want to do now is say, what is d? Well, d is projection onto xy plane. So if we project these, we get just the lines y equals x, x equals 1, and for this one, we can project that. It's just 0 equals 12xy. That's really just a point, you know. The only way this works is if x is 0 or if y is 0 x equals 0 or y equals 0. So those are our three or four bounds once we've projected it. So let's draw a picture of that. Well, the first one, x equals 0, y equals 0, means we're in the first quadrant. y equals x. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but in this case it does, because we've got y equals x, and we've got x equals 1. But the fact that it's stuck in the first quadrant, that the projection there of this shape gave us x was 0 and y was 0, means we stop right here. So once we've done the projection, we then write the bounds for z and for x and y the same way we did in the previous units. We'll do dy dx, or you could do dx dy, and this is d here. So y goes from 0 to x, and x goes from 0 to 1. If you wanted to do y, x first, you would say x goes from y to 1, and then y goes from 0 to 1. Okay, so I'm going to erase this, and now it's just a matter of turning the crank and getting to the answer. Hard part is done. Like I say, the setup is at least 7 out of 10 on a quiz. Okay, so we'll get 0, 1, 0, x, 
z equals 0 to z equals 12xy of z squared over 2 dy dx is 0, 1, 0, x of 144x squared y squared over 2 dy dx, which I will pull out the constants here. I'll take a minute to do that. 72, 0, 1, 0, x of this one is actually factorable, but oh well. x squared, y squared, dy, dx is 72, 0, 1. Oh, that's, that's factored, yeah. 0, 1, x squared, dx, 0, 1. Uh, I'm sorry, that was my mistake. Back up, it's not factorable because this is x, not 1. Oof. Don't make that mistake. That's an easy one to make. All right, 72, 0, 1, y equals 0 to y equals x of x squared y cubed over 3 dx. So let's take the divide by 3 out. It'll become 72 divided by 3 is 24, 0 to 1 of x to the fifth dx, which is... 24, 0 to 1 of 1 over 6, x to the 4th, which just becomes 4, 24 divided by 6, times 1 to the 4th, minus 4 times 0 to the 4th, which is just 4. That's your answer. All right, so we're just going to keep going. Now, like I said, there's six different orders you can do these in, and so some will call them type 1, type 2, type 3, type whatever regions. Again, I do not care about the names. I just want you to understand that you can always reorder, but sometimes one ordering is easier than others. So here, let's evaluate the triple integral of the function x squared plus z squared dv, where e is the region bounded by the paraboloid y equals x squared plus z squared and the plane y equals 4. All right, so copy that down. So, which are we going to do first? Well, okay, so let's say that y equals x squared plus z squared. So, hold on a second, let me make sure I've got this right. Um, that would be the same as saying z squared equals y minus x squared. So if we tried to integrate that, then we'd have z equals plus or minus square root of y minus x squared. So our integral would have to start as negative y minus x squared to square root of y minus x squared of square root of x squared plus z squared dz. And that looks bad. I don't even want to try dealing with the x and y right now because that seems like this seems ugly so let's see if we can find another way to do this one all right well let's try and graph the shape we are talking about so we had a paraboloid which was y equals x squared plus z squared Remember back from chapter 12, our first unit, paraboloid, we think of as x and z increase, y will increase as well. But no matter what x and z are, y will always be positive. 
In fact, we could think of level curves. x squared plus z squared equals k. So these are circles with radius of root k. Of Yes, yes, that's right. So as we go out along y, as y, you know, the k is in place of y, we will get circles of greater and greater radius. On the other hand, if we just compare x and z, or sorry, y and z, you know, y equals z squared plus k, those are parabolas. Same as y equals x squared plus k. So these are connected by parabolas like this. So that's the basic shape we are dealing with, this sort of conical kind of, uh, well, it's paraboloid is what it's called, but it's kind of like a horn, or, you know, one of those cornucopia horns that you see at Thanksgiving or a big, big ham chunk or something like that. I don't know. Okay, so what if we project Y? What if we do Y first? dy first. Okay, well let's see what we would get if we projected y. Well if y equals 0, we would get um, or two things. There was also y equals 4, right? Okay, so we'll cut off here at y equals 4. That is circle with radius 2 x squared plus z squared equals 4. That's circle with radius 2. So radius equals 2. And so what I am seeing is that we are going to go along y. So y goes from this curve. And this curve was y equals x squared plus z squared. So uh, what was the function? The function itself, let's change it back put it back in, was uh, square root of x squared plus z squared. We'll do dy first. So y will go from x squared plus z squared up to 4. So just imagine you're going along the y-axis. At every point, you'll start on this red paraboloid, and you'll end at this flat plane where z equals 4. Now, if we project these downward, so we're going to smash it down onto this plane, the xz plane. And it looks like what we're going to get is a circle. This will be the shadow of this blue circle here with its radius 2. If we want to project it directly, we get y equals 0, so this first one becomes x squared plus z squared equals 0, so that's just the origin. And we get y equals 4. So that is a circle where all these circles with radius 2 is the max and radius 0 is the smallest. Hey, that's the same as saying, maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but, well, no, I think this is a good place to go. We can say we're going to end double integral across D where this circle here is D, DA. That circle has a radius of 2, so all the little circles are included because we're going from 0 to 2. And since it's a full circle, we get theta from 0 to pi. So yeah, we're going to change this to polar. And you might be thinking, well, polar is supposed to be x and y, but this is x and z, but that doesn't matter in the slightest because... The names of the coordinates don't mean much. Specifically, we can say that if you really, if you needed to substitute, you would say this time z is r sine theta and x is r cosine theta, because z is just in the place where y would normally be. So that means we are in a circle here, 
And so we're just going to do polar integral. It becomes, let's do the innermost integral first. Uh, well, no, hold on, hold on. Let's be careful about this. Z, so then, how do we do this? Ah, ah, okay, I'm going to erase some stuff, so copy down if you need to. All right, this first integral is y, the integrand, the thing that's in the function inside, has no y's in it, so it's constant. So it's actually, this first integral is super easy, because we'll just get, so we'll do double integral d, we'll keep that in the parentheses here, from y equals x squared plus z squared up to y equals 4 of y square root of x squared plus z squared dA. And so that becomes double integral across d of 4 square root of x squared plus z squared minus x squared plus z squared times square root of x squared plus z squared. And we still got dA out here. Here's where I want to go ahead and change to r. So I'm doing the substitution r squared equals x squared plus z squared. Because again, that's the circle we had was x and z. And it, so on that circle, it, z is just in place of where y would normally be. So this becomes double integral where r goes from 0 to 2, and theta goes from 0 to pi of 4. I guess this would just be r squared of x squared plus x minus, this will be r squared, and this will also be just r, so r minus r cubed. And then r dr d theta. So we get, uh, we can factor this one, because it's a polar rectangle, circle to be specific. 0 to pi d theta, 0 to 2 of 4r squared minus r fourth dr, which is 2 theta, 0 to 2 of 4r cubed over 3 minus r fifth over 5, which is 2 pi times... 32 over 3 minus 32 over 5, which reduces to 128 pi over 5. Did I write that doesn't look right? Let's check this. 2 pi times, let's see, times, common denominator is 15, so it would be 96 over 15. No, times 5. No, sorry, it would be... Uh, 32 times 5 is 160, minus times 3 is 96 over 5, which is, oh yeah, 2 pi times 64 over 5. Okay, 15, 15. That's, that is a problem. Ah, yeah, that should be a 15. My notes, dumb mistake in my notes. 128 pi over 15. Okay. Let's keep moving. All right, so let's do a little practice reordering. Let's say you have 0, 1, 0, x squared, 0, y of some function f of x, y, z, dz, dy, dx. I don't even care what the function is right now. I just want to practice on reordering. Well, I'm going to try to draw this thing, this region, x, y, and z. Okay, so z goes from 0 to y. So we will draw the 
z equals y would look like this. It would be this line and the z y plane. And then what else do we have? Okay, so let's look at these two by themselves. So project onto the xy plane. Well, what we are left with, if we look at this, just ignore, just cover up this middle part. Don't even think about it. Y goes from 0 to x squared. So we need y equals x squared. And x goes from 0 to 1. All right, so if y goes from 0 to x squared, that's what, that's what this says, that 0 is less or equal to y is less or equal to x squared. So that means we will go left to right. No, no, it doesn't say that. It means we will go from bottom to top, doesn't it? Y is increasing 0 to x squared. Okay, so we need to go like this. And then x stops when we get to x equals 1. So that's what it should look like. So what would that look like in the rest of this? Well... We've got this quadratic, this parabola in the xy plane, so let's draw it on the floor here. x, y will look like that. And then the other thing we have is this x equals 1, that's a line, so in the xy plane it looks like this. And so we end up with some really strange shape that's hard to draw. It's a picture in the textbook, I believe. But you end up having to have sort of a curve that's above this curve. So the shadow of it is down here in this plane, this D. And so you got this sort of sloped wall here that bounds it. And you've also got a line x equals y, so it goes right above it like this. So you get this really kind of odd shape in 3D. Now, what if we want to reorder this? For some reason, we need to do it in a different order. Well, what we can do is we can try to project this onto the YZ plane. Excuse me. So we will smash it against here, thus getting rid of the X first. Well, I will look at my bounds, and I say if I get rid of the x, so what I say here is that z, this first integral, is between 0 and y. That doesn't change anything. The second integral, y, goes from 0 to x squared. Well, that's... Um, Let's see, how else do we do this? And x goes from 0 to 1. So we just want to rearrange these two. Um, sorry, hold on, let me think of, make sure I'm saying this right. So what would this look like on the yz plane? So let's see what we have. Well, we have z is between 0 and y. So z equals y is this diagonal line here. And we have x is 0 to 1. That doesn't help us much. But if I plug these in here, I then it becomes y is between 0 and 0. Well, that's kind of silly. But if we plug in 1, we get y is between 0 and 1. So it's this. So you see what we did? We took the one we knew that we had already gotten rid of, and we plugged it into the others to figure out what their bounds were. What if we went on the xz plane? Like I say, I am trying to explain this in a way that makes sense. I am not promising that this is the best or the perfect explanation. This is something I find difficult. But on to XZ plane. So we say, okay, 
So the original ones were, again, z goes from 0 to y, but now y is gone. We say 0 goes from y to or y is between 0 and x squared. Again, that one's not great. But we know 0 to 1 is x, so x will stop there. Can we get y? Hmm. Hmm, well, let's think about what that means. That means y equals x squared is, at the, is the boundary. So what if we take this x squared and just replace that y? Then that means z is between 0 and x squared. So we will draw x squared here. z is between 0 and x squared. So it should be this part. No, it shouldn't. z is the vertical in this case, so it should be this part. z is lower end at 0, so it's down here and goes up to z equals x squared. All right, so I hope that helps a little with doing this drawing. And we are going to do a couple more examples before we call it. So, finding volume. And we got a straightforward formula that if you integrate the one function with respect to v over a surface e, or in region E, you get the volume of that region E. So like I said earlier, I think I mentioned this in class, that if you have a ceiling and the floor is zero, you're doing the double and it gives you the volume. You kind of assume you've already done the Z part and replaced it with the floor and ceiling. All right, so let's find the volume of the tetrahedron bounded by the planes x plus 2y plus z equals 2, x equals 2y, x equals 0, and z equals 0. All right. Feel free to erase. So let's draw a quick picture of this one. It's usually a good idea to try to draw a picture, even though it's difficult. Even if your picture isn't good, at least you'll sort of understand what you're dealing with a little better. And again, it's only through trial and error that you know if you want to reorient the tetrahedron. I'm guessing if you looked at it from a different angle, it would not be as clear. So x plus 2y plus z equals 2. So that means we have intercepts of 2, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 2. So here's here, and here, and here. Which would give us a plane that looks like this. But we want to see where does it intersect the other. So the other plane was x equals 2y. So x equals 2y, you know, in two dimensions, that's a line with slope 1 half. So we will go like this. And let's cut this off because I want to block it where it actually, where does it actually intersect with the other plane? plane. Let's figure that out. 
x plus 2y plus z equals 2 and x equals 2y. So we'll replace that. We'll make it... Now let's put it... Uh, let's see, how do we do this? How do we do this? Oh, oh! And if we're in the xy plane, then z equals 0. So we get 2y plus 2y equals 2. So y would be 1 half. And if x equals 2y, x equals 1. So we get the point 1, 1 half, and 0. So the trick here was to say that we were told z equals 0 was the bound, meaning the xy plane. So we just plugged in z equals 0 and tried to find where these intersected. And that gives us this tetrahedron, where this left face is x equals 2y, and the right face is x plus 2y plus z is 2. So now we have to decide what order do we want to integrate. Well, this x equals 2y is a vertical plane, meaning it's never going to be the ceiling, no matter what point we have in this region D on the floor. So I'd say we start with Z, because that means Z is bounded between 0 and solve this equation for Z, 2 minus X minus 2Y. Now, we could have gone left to right. We could have maybe done Y first, because then you would say Y would go from solve this for y, you would have x over 2, and then solve the right side for y, you'd have, um, I guess, 1 half 2 minus x. So if you want to do y first, that would be it. But then you'd have to project onto the xz plane. And since we're already got our projection onto the xy plane that we can see pretty clearly, I think this is probably easier. So, we were asked for volume, so that means we're integrating the 1 function. So we'll have triple integral 1 dz, so z will go from 0 to 2 minus x minus 2y. And then let's figure out what we get when we project in the xy plane. So this line here goes from 0 to 1 comma 1 half. And then x goes up to 1. So x and 0 to 1. So this is x equals 2y. All right, so that should be fine. So let's say x then goes from right, which side do we want? We want this side where y equals 0. This is y equals 0 here. So we need the side that touches y equals 0. So that's this. OK, so x will go. Let's do x first, from 2y to 1. So we're going left to right. Then y will go from 0 to 1 half. And again, you could just easily do y first, say y goes from 0 to x over 2. All right. And then we get 0 to 1 half, 2y to 1. And this will just become 2 minus x minus 2y dx dy. Because you would place that 1, you do the integral, it gives us z, and then you'd plug in this top for z, this bottom for z, it would be this minus 0. And so like I said, this is the same as we did earlier when we found volume integrals by saying declare the ceiling to be the function you're integrating and then integrate across the region and the floor. So it ends up being the same thing as we did before. So let's do this. 0 to 1 half, and then from x is 2y to x is 1 of 2x minus x squared over 2 minus 2xy dy, which becomes 0 to 1 half of, plug in 1 for x, so it's 2 minus 1 half minus 2y minus, I'm plugging 2y, so 4y uh, 
2y times 2y, that's 4y squared over 2, so it's minus 2y squared minus, now plug in 2y for x, so it's 2 times 2y, so that's 4y times y is 4y squared. I don't seem to have this one worked out, so if, you know, if it turns out I make a mistake and you can show it to me, then, I don't know, do, I, do you get extra credit for that? Seems reasonable. I don't think I'm making any mistakes right now, though. 3 halves minus 6y. This is minus 6y squared in here with another negative. It becomes plus 6y squared dy. So that then turns into 0 to 1 half of 3 halves y minus 3y squared plus 2y cubed. Uh, from, uh, let me fix that there. That should not be a bar anymore. Or it should not be an integral. It should just be a vertical bar. Becomes 3 halves times 1 half minus 3 times 1 half squared plus 2 times 1 half cubed minus 0. Because all these have y in them, so they'll be 0. So that comes out to 3 fourths minus 3 fourths, 1 fourth squared is plus 2 times 1 over 8. So that's 2 over 8, which is 1 fourth. So that's the volume of that tetrahedron, 1 fourth. Okay. And just one more thing I want to, to show you, and that's mean value theorem, or mean value formula, perhaps. Mean value, I'm not sure if I call it a theorem or a formula. I'll call it a theorem. Well, it says that when we're integrating over a shape, we there is a, it's kind of like center of mass, I guess. The average value you would take the whole integral and that would give you the total mass or charge or whatever. And then if you divide that by the volume of the region, that gives you the average value. And so it's sort of like saying, if you could take this charge or whatever it is that is oddly distributed and spread it out as evenly as possible, this F would be the value I would have at every point. So, for instance, problem 57 in the text, it says there is a cube with side length of L in the first octant. And so find average value of the function x, y, z. So that's goes out to L in this direction and L in this direction is a square and then it goes up to a distance of L as well. Something like that. L, L, L. So, what is the volume of this cube? It's an L there. Volume of the cube here, E, is just L to the third power. So the average value then, F average, would be 1 over L to the third times the triple integral of x, y, z, 0, l, 0, l, 0, l, dx, dy, dz, this could be changed as 0, l, x, dx, 0, l, y, dy, 0, l, z, dz, 
Um, these are all dummy variables. If you, by the way, this X, Y, Z, if you look at these, these three integrals are exactly the same. They just have different names. So let's just change this into, this op step is optional, but zero to one of U, D, U, it's an L, sorry, cubed. Meaning each one of these integrals is going to give me the same value. So I'll just do one of them with a dummy variable and just cube it. So 1 over L cubed, and go from 0 to L of U squared over 2 cubed at the end. That's 1 over L cubed of L squared over 2 cubed, which is 1 over L cubed of L to the 6th over... 8, yes, 8, which becomes L cubed over 8, which incidentally is also L over 2 to the third, so it turned out you just have each one and cube them, but there was no way we could have known that in advance. Yeah, all right. So, for instance, for problem number 58, it's asked you to find the average height of a function. So, that means, well, height is just the same as z. So, z average would be 1 over the volume of your region times the triple integral across that region of the function z, z in place of f. The f is the z in this case, dv. And that's a little...